Well, these solar cells and how they work, let's see if we can find out more now. Russell Turner is with us, Wodonga Senior Secondary College Electrotechnology teacher and also Systems Engineering teacher. Russell, welcome to the program. I feel like I need a degree just to say your capacity there. Great to be here, Joseph. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming in. It seems like perfect weather for solar systems with the heat and the sunshine at the moment, doesn't it? Victoria certainly seems to have a lot of um, renewable energy uh, available for use, that's for sure. Well, we spoke to uh, Professor Andrew Blakers from Australia National University yesterday and he said that Victoria has enough sunshine and enough land space that if you covered it in solar panels you could power the entire world with the electricity. Yeah, Australia's pretty lucky in that regard. We seem to have plenty of solar energy available for use, that's for sure. It's amazing, the mind boggles to think that. A lot of people, though, they're really keen to to, to go ahead with solar and renewable energy and try and do their bit and yet as you've just heard from Sandra there just sticking point is the the cost of solar panels now why are they so expensive well they're made from silicon but if, if, and clearly that there's plenty of that in the, in, in the on the planet but in its, in its in its present form it's not that useful it's uh, quite reflective and it doesn't in its normal state doesn't actually conduct electricity at all so this has to go through certain processes um, this process is similar to, both, to making an integrated circuit really, so a lot of these things are, are manufactured under ultra-clean conditions and you must remember that these things are designed to withstand hailstones and they have a, they have a lifespan exceeding 20 years, so um, you know it's quite a lot of uh, chemical engineering goes on there and um, it, believe it or not it's a quite sophisticated um, process where they're made, so um, it's not surprising that they're costly but with economies of scale, and I'm talking China, who's um, become quite a major manufacturer of these devices, hopefully in time that will come down. But um, there is a fair amount of cost associated with the actual construction and design of the system as well. Um, for it to work well, there has to be an inverter, which again adds cost to the system. And um, I guess the immediate benefits aren't apparent, but that's only on the basis that electricity costs will remain the same. No one's going to assume that that will be the case. And how does it actually, how does it work? I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that silicon in, in I suppose, a raw sort of a form doesn't even conduct electricity. So That's correct, yeah. It seems quite uh, astounding to think you'd even make solar panels out of it. Well, it is. If you think about it, the fact that, um, you know, um, a, a, a light can fall on a substance and then generate electricity is pretty amazing in itself. Um, Solar panels, basically um, the silicon's processed and it's, um, it's actually um, a few impurities are added because pure silicon doesn't conduct. So uh, certain, certain, uh, elements of, um, uh, certain elements are added to the silicon in the process. Um, most people realise that sunlight is in the form of photons um, and uh, when a photon falls on the panel it actually dislodges one of the outer electrons. Those electrons are then guided through the panel by copper tracks and then uh, the output of that panel is then applied to its particular um, uh, uh, application and then uh, the electrons are then sort of returned because it's a circuit. So it's basically um, energy in the form of photons falling on a surface, um, those photons dislodge electrons and then those, those electrons are then channeled and then put to use. Well I'm somewhat disappointed I have to say Russell because uh, I was going to ask whether we could make one at home. It's not one of those things that you could probably do at home Joseph. Although you could make, you know, a, a sort of a replica cell, but I don't think it'd have very good efficiency. Um, the reason why some of these things are, because technology doesn't stay the same, the panels that you're seeing are being applied now are not going to be the panels that are going to be available in five years. The new panels that are, that are being manufactured now have organic dyes in them so that they don't just respond to white light, they actually respond to all of the colours of the spectrum. So uh, at the moment I think a panel would be around roughly between 15 and 20 per cent efficient, but with the new technologies I'll be approaching 35 and 40 per cent. What will that mean then? Will that mean that they would become even, well obviously I guess more competitive than the current panels? Would they become competitive enough to overtake fossil fuels? Um, well, Australia has abundant reserves of fossil fuels and we're very good at using them. Um, and fortunately we do have those fossil fuels available because we couldn't service the demands that we need today on these hot days. So in the short term there will always be a, a, you know, a requirement for some sort of fossil fuels, but as the efficiencies of these devices improve and increase, um, and um, the demands for um, less and less um, carbon dioxide being inputted into the atmosphere, 
um, they'll become more and more efficient and um, more and more desirable. Um, this, at the moment, the senior college has um, its own renewable system. Um, it's a 1.5 kilowatt system, and up until now, we've managed since its installation, we've managed to uh, offset three three tons of carbon dioxide. How how much? Does it help out with the electricity bills? For instance, do you feed it back into the grid or you use everything you produce? We do. It's, um, it's a grid connect system and um, an interesting thing about our installation is that we can actually analyse the data in real time. If, you, if, if your listeners are interested, they can log on to the school's web, website, just um, Google WSSC, and there's a live link there that gives um, interested people um, the data, live data stream coming from the solar panel. So in real time you can tell how much energy is being produced at any particular one time and how much greenhouse gases we're actually saving as well. Amazing. So you think the way that these dyes are going to work, they're just, well, it's hard to get your head around even the way the, the current solar panels work, but they'll respond to a greater spectrum of light, which Absolutely. is great. So if it's cloudy, they're still going to pick up. Well, at the moment, the panels that we're using basically respond to visible light but the, the panels that are being developed with these organic dyes in them will respond to the ultraviolet and the infrared spectrum as well, so there'll be a greater output of power from, mm. the, from the similar surface area. Oh, I see. Right, I misunderstood. So they'll be able to just see spectrums that can't even be seen at all at the That's moment. That's correct, yeah. Extraordinary, isn't it? And the technology for that will be what it'll be mass produced within five years or absolutely um, economies of scale demand that that the price has to be fairly competitive with existing technologies although the, de the benefits would allow a little bit of a premium but as your as your listeners are aware um, cost is a major major um, impediment and it's hard to justify the long-term benefits when you have to come up with a significant amount of money straight up so. although if you can feed it back into the grid it that's, helps a bit. That's correct. Um, we have uh, the government's recently put up new feed feed-in tariffs, and uh, the idea is that um, for every kilowatt of energy that um, is put back into the grid, a certain amount of money gets rebated off your bill. In the sense, spinning your meter backwards. Hmm. Uh, a little bit of conjecture, which we've looked at in the last couple of days, as to whether it should be a gross feed-in tariff or a net feed-in. But anyway, it's a net feed-in tariff, which means it's only the excess that you don't use that can be counted. Uh, with any um, one of those that sort of attractive uh, feed-in tariff rate, mm. um, do you think it's the sort of thing with with that kind of pricing structure? Will these systems, you know, is it possible for them to I don't know basically subsidise themselves over a period of time, or not likely? Well, Joseph, you can't assume that the uh, the cost of electricity is going to remain the same um, with. Um, uh, impediments on um, the amount of greenhouse gases that can be uh, put into the um, environment, it's clear that ev eventually electricity prices will increase and that will make solar renewable systems much more attractive. Yeah, well, electricity isn't going to go down in price, is it? I don't think so. <laughs> Somehow. Okay, well, look, it's great to hear you explain that there's electrons flying all around the place in these solar panels, Yep. even though that kind of means, I don't know... I well, maybe we could go home and make one up if we found out how to... But it means we're going to have to catch these electrons somehow and stick them Some in Some other way, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Russell, thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure.